being intentional and making sure that you know you act with awareness for what you really want out of your one precious life you know that's the key to not having major end of life regrets so that's i think the key personally Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Consider how often do we leave our dreams for someday? They're up in the air and we don't actually work towards them because we think we have more time. Well, today's episode is on building a life rich in experiences. We've been taught to measure our wealth in currency, but at the end of our lives, the regrets of the dying aren't about money. They're about experiences they didn't have. To talk about how we can live fuller lives, richer in experiences, our guests today are Bridget Hilton and Joe Huff. Bridget and Joe are social good entrepreneurs who are obsessed with experiences. They have spent years interviewing social science experts, conducting the largest study on life experiences ever done. Together, they have trained to be samurai, danced with the Northern Lights, tracked silverback gorillas in a hailstorm, stood face to face with hungry lions on safari, sped across glaciers on dog sleds, built schools for kids in need, studied with monks, seen the seven wonders of the world, and more. They've recently released their new book, Experiential Billionaire. Build a life rich in experiences and die with no regrets. A blueprint backed by research on the art, science, and path to building a life rich in experiences. Hello, Bridget and Joe. How are you two doing today? Wonderful. How are you? Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. I'm super excited. Um, So let's start off by talking about this concept that you're all about called the experiential billionaire. What does that even mean? It means someone that's rich in life experiences and prioritizes fulfilling experiences over everything else. I love that concept because I feel like I am the same way. Like those are my values as well. Like I value experiences and seeing the world. And I, I wanted to bring you on because you guys have such an interesting life and that you, you go deep into this topic. So, um, my next question is in both of your eyes, what is the key to a fulfilling life? I think it's being intentional and making sure that, you know, you act with awareness for what you really want out of your one precious life. You know, that's the key to not having major end of life regrets. So that's, I think the key personally. I love it. So let's go back and talk about your story. I, I want to hear both of your stories and, and how you met. I, I'm not sure where you'd like to start, but I, like, you know, I, I want to understand what brought you to this point where you, now you've written a book and now you're all about being an experiential billionaire. Sure. sure. Yeah, we'd love to tell you the stories. Uh, yeah, Joe can go first and then I'll tell you mine and we'll, mm-hmm. we'll kind of, uh, you know, tell everyone how we met and how we got there. Yeah, and I'll go first just because I'm like so much older. So it starts back <laughs> with the dinosaurs. And you know, when, when I was first, no, yeah, Bridget and I, uh, you know, we were we were both really, really inherently wealthy growing up. And we just wanted to, you know, travel the world. And we thought, let's just do it. And then, oh, wait, no, wait, that was somebody else. That was someone completely <laughs> different. Yeah, so, you know, it all, it all starts pretty far back for me. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I had a kind of bumpy road. And I barely actually managed to graduate high school, um, but but I, I did graduate. And right around that time, though, that I was trying to figure out my life, um, I didn't have a, quite a lot of direction yet. Um, something happened. My my dad actually had a uh, a very sudden near death experience, um, where my dad suddenly, at the age of forty eight, wound up. We, we thought he was having a heart attack. We took him to the hospital. It turned out it was much more than a heart attack. He actually had heart failure and he was, um, he, his heart was failing right then. And, uh, that kicked off a really crazy period in my life. Um, because, you know, it was a couple of months. They bumped him right to the top of the heart transplant list. And while we were waiting, you know, I just kept thinking about all the things my dad had still wanted to do with his life that he hadn't done yet because he was so young, he was 48, and he talked about the things he wanted to do, but, you know, in this future tense of like when I retire or when I have time later, but he just never made time for any of those things. And uh, 
you know, that was a really important moment in my life because it was this terrifying, terrifying moment that gave me this great gift of urgency because I was made suddenly very aware that my my goals and my dreams, you know, there was no guarantee on how much time I had to live my life. And, you know, like the story with my dad, it's the actual health situation may not have been avoidable, but what was avoidable was the regret for the things that he hadn't done yet. So, um, you know, that was right around when like my, my idea of like what wealth was started to kind of shift. Um, and that changed my life. My dad's story has a happy ending. First of all, you know, he actually, he got a heart transplant. Um, mm. and afterwards, you know, he could have done the safe thing and like stayed in his tiny inner city apartment close to the hospital and doctors. But, but after what he went through, he knew what was at stake. Right. So he, he changed everything because he had to, he had to change his whole life. He had to recreate the life that he wanted to live because he was living this life that was just kind of happening. Um, and, uh, that was really powerful for me. And that, what were some of the, th the changes or yeah, what, he, what did he do? He actually, so he had been living in this tiny apartment in the inner city. Um, and, uh, he moved to Mexico. My dad had never even oh, been to cool. Mexico. He moved to a small <laughs> beach town in Mexico. Yeah. Like literally almost all the things he did, a, I never, yeah, but I, I never even like knew he wanted to do these things, but B, I would never have guessed he would have ever done those things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he wound up moving to this tiny beach town in Mexico that he stumbled on on accident. And, uh, he, he swam in the sea of Cortez and he learned how to sail and he went kayaking and mountain biking and hiking and, you know, became like really social, which he had never really been. And he, you know, had these organized sunset dinners and he just lived this really amazing second life, a very, very different life. Yeah. And that was like, when that happened for me at like 18 years old, witnessing that, I was like, wow, I want to figure out what I want to do so I don't have to make all those changes if something happens to me and I'm suddenly out of time. So I want to figure that out now. And uh, that was really a driving force for like how I, you know, moved forward in life. Um, and again, those, the bumpy road I mentioned starting off, I didn't have a lot of opportunities um, post high school for instant kind of, you know, wealth building or experience building. I, uh, you know, uh, I jokingly like to say, you know, my parents, we came from a really blue collar background. So um, I jokingly like to say that uh, my closest experience to a trust fund was trusting my parents would fund a trip to the ice cream truck. So there was not like a, a fallback. Um, so I just started trying to do all of these things. I was making lists of things I wanted to do because of this awareness that my dad had given me. Um, and I used that urgency and awareness to, to move forward, to take action. And I started just like doing things that were really rewarding for me. And uh, they weren't like necessarily like bucket list or, you know, life changing at the time things. But that's really, I think, a big part of our message in general is once you start taking action towards your goals and your dreams, and you take, start taking steps, more things become available the more opportunities arise and that was really like what happened in my life that was just kind of this snowball effect like where the more things i did the more opportunities came up and uh you know that went on you know none of those things you know full disclaimer to anyone listening none of those things early on equated to any kind of financial windfall <laughs> i didn't suddenly like all of a sudden oh i'm living my dreams and guess what i'm getting rich and i'm doing all these other things but uh it turned out that um those things had a lot of value that i didn't see at the time and it started to equate because i think that's something that i i it's important to address early is that it's not about experiences versus money it's about experiences being the most important thing and a good way mm -hmm. i think i can like i can paint a picture about that is at one point in my 20s, I actually, you know, had been unfortunate enough to, I had a series of misfortunes happen where I lost everything and I actually had to file for bankruptcy. And I was like devastated. I was going to have to tell people that I was bankrupt. And then I went and saw the bankruptcy attorney and they told me that it was $2,500 to file for bankruptcy. So I actually had to tell people I'd like to be bankrupt, but I actually <laughs> just can't afford it. That's so, funny. but the reason I think that's funny is because since then, you know, like my, my wealth has grown immensely, but 
in the currency of life experiences, but that's worth more to me because there is no bankruptcy for life experiences. I have those forever and money will come and go, but the time that we spend to earn our lives and our experiences, that's the stuff that we, we actually can never lose. And uh, the time is the most important thing. So as I went on like with my life experiences, some of the things that became uh, opportunities for me were um, I actually had you know, the thing about experiences that's funny is like you build relationships. A lot of our strongest bonds come through the experiences we share. So I was meeting lots of people and just becoming like, you know, I was finding like new lifelong friends. And uh, one of those people asked me to start a business with them, which was, you know, crazy because again, I didn't even, I barely graduated high school. <laughs> and uh, it turned out though, it worked out really well. And we wound up building a successful company from a, a small little two person graphic t-shirt operation that turned into like a hundred person shipping company. And that was a, a really powerful moment because at one point when we got to like a hundred people in this company, I realized I had only been working. I had stopped doing all the things I wanted to do. 10 years had gone yeah. by and I kind of became my dad. It was mm -hmm. the same thing that was happening yep. to him. And, uh, that revelation had me, um, it, it woke me up. I guess is a good way to say it. I started to find that urgency again. And I left that company to do things that I thought I would regret not doing. And mm -hmm. that led me to um, trying to start working with charities, which I had zero idea about because I never really did that. And uh, I wound up getting to travel and work with a bunch of charity organizations. And that actually was such an incredible decision because that led me to meeting Bridget, who then her and I kicked off a whole nother decade of work together. And I'll let Bridget tell that part of the story. All right, let's take a quick break for our sponsor, Uncommon Goods. If you want to be the most unique gifter this holiday season, Uncommon Goods is your secret weapon. Uncommon Goods takes the stress out of holiday shopping as they scour the globe for the most remarkable and truly unique gifts, whether you're shopping for Secret Santa or your entire family. To give an example, here are a couple gifts I liked from their site. So one was called the 12 Days of Hot Sauce Advent Calendar. This is a cute package of 12 different hot sauces to try in 12 days this holiday season. Another one is the Storybook DIY Kit kit, which is an intricately detailed 3D wooden puzzle that doubles as a reading light. It's a great gift for anyone who loves unique, charming decor. When you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. You can be sure that the products are high quality, unique, and out of the ordinary. There's really something for everyone. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash TLL. That's uncommongoods.com slash TLL for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. So when Joe and I met, uh, we met in 2012. So it's been 11 years working together. But um, we kind of instantly felt like family because we were both from like very humble beginnings, uh, I would say. And uh, I can start there, go back real quick. Uh, I'm from Flint, Michigan, which is uh, a very like blue collar auto industry town. Um, my whole family works in like, you know, that General Motors and places like that. It's like a place that's famous for very negative things, you know, like the water crisis and like Michael Moore movies and stuff like that. And when I was a kid, I had like very big dreams, even when I was very small of like getting out of that place and, and moving to, you know, Hollywood and like living that dream life that I could see like on TV. Like I would watch things like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and stuff like that and just like kind of fantasize about being there. So what I did when I was a kid is I just took a million tiny small steps towards that goal because that was like, it was like my one focus in life was like getting out and doing something that I was passionate about. Um, but I didn't have anyone that was like around me that was like in entertainment, you know, it's not like, uh, LA or New York or something like that, where, you know, people in the business. Um, so I started doing things like, uh, when I was 14, I started working, you know, the closest to music that I could find, which is like picking up trash at like, uh, concert venues and festivals and stuff like, like Lollapalooza and stuff like that. Uh, getting coffee for people at radio stations and like selling band merchandise out of vans. And um, 
you know, that lasted about five years total. And um, I can tell you, I never made any more than like $5 an hour (laughs) doing that stuff. Um, But it was a good experience. And uh, it led me to uh, work at Universal Music Group. uh, In when I was 19, I started there. And it was, you know, I think I made like 20 grand a year, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it like really gave me the confidence and gave me the, um, the, this like experience that I was like, I can actually make things happen if I want to. And I try hard enough. Right. So, you know, I'm working at universal and then they suddenly shut down the branch in Detroit and it was like, all of my dreams just got shattered. And I thought it was like the end of my life, <laughs> even though I was so young, still I was like 20. They shut down the branch and it ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me. Cause then I was kind of forced to move to California, which is, uh, I moved to LA and I started working at their headquarters here. And then this whole like new world opened up where I was suddenly spending time with like all these, you know, people that were in the beginning of their careers, but, and were young, but were, you know, on the ascent, like, like Taylor Swift and, you know, Kanye and Drake and Lady Gaga and the killers and like all these huge, you know, these people that are now superstars. So it was an awesome experience. I got to do all this cool stuff, like go to movie premieres and like, you know, go to the Grammys and all these things that I like dreamed about when I was a kid. And, you know, I was still broke, but like, I felt like anything was possible then. Like I was being surrounded by all these cool people and like people that were really following their dreams and really inspiring. And um, so over the next few years, like I kind of got like the true like sex, drugs and rock and roll experience that I had dreamed of. Um, But only there was like more Microsoft Excel and cubicles than I anticipated. One day at the office, I was just working. I saw this video of... Uh, that was like viral on YouTube and it was of a woman hearing for the first time Uh, and she was around the same age as me and it really got me thinking about how important and vital music had been in my life and how I wouldn't have been where I was without being able to hear sound and uh, it was kind of like a light bulb moment like like how could I do this for someone else that's so cool how could I like provide that experience for somebody and I ended up sending the video to Joe, who I had like met through mutual friends. And he was the only person that I knew that was working in like a charitable aspect of, of anything in their life. So I was like, basically sent him the video. I was like, how could we do something like this? Like, this is so cool. And, um, you know, we, long story short, we ended up starting a company called Listen um, that sells headphones and speakers. And we give the proceeds to giving people hearing around the world. Um, and it was like, we've been working on that since 2012. And it's been like a real roller coaster of a time and um, lots of up and downs, like financially, lots of ups and downs, like experientially, like we, I mean, we just had the most incredible time. Like we've, we've given over 50,000 people hearing for the first time all around the world. So we've seen the craziest things, but one of the funnier moments was when I was on um, like Forbes and Inc. 30 under 30 one year. And um, (laughs) it was funny because at the time we were like, you know, very much not paying ourselves and uh, just basically giving away all of our money and traveling. So we didn't have any money. So I was like, uh, are you sure I'm supposed to be on this list? Because like, I literally have like less than $30 in my bank account. (laughs) But um, around that time, people started reaching out like, uh, you know, all facets of my life, like people I went to like high school with or whatever, and they were asking for money. And I had to be like, I, I know that it appears in the media that I am like wealthy but the truth is like i don't have anything but i am like i feel like an experiential billionaire and that's kind of (laughs) where the name for the book and where all of this like comes to a head is that at that moment we like looked around and we realized that we were like we don't have any money but we feel so rich in so many ways because of the opportunities that we've been given through traveling and through like being very intentional about how we're spending our time and our efforts, and our money, and whatnot. So it, it was uh, it was the best thing that ever happened was was being able to start that company and being able to give back and like have those experiences.
Yeah. And, and to be clear, or, you know, we're not, you know, on skid row, we actually, it, it's not about like being, the, the goal isn't to be broke and yeah, experience rich. It's about, um, you know, prioritizing experiences because it'll lead to a lot of other things and a lot of other opportunities. And one of the things I think it's really important to just point out is, you know, when we talk about the wealth that we felt at the time, it wasn't like, oh, we're so wealthy because we got to go to, you know, Machu Picchu and like travel, you know, to all these parts of the world that are exotic. We felt so rich because we had all of these incredible relationships with all these people. You know, we were exposed to all these cultures. We learned all these things. We had all these negative experiences that still had value. Like our lives felt full. And I think that's really the thing that is important that, you know, there was a moment when I was at the end of building that company that I had, I had the most financial security I'd ever had in my life. But for the first time ever, my life felt empty. And that was a really, you know, ironic moment that, you know, we're trying to help people avoid. Yeah. I think it, I, I mean, I love hearing your story. Thank you for sharing. Um, it's interesting how you, like, I think most people see it as either or, like you chase money or you chase experiences. And it is hard to be able to chase both at the same time, but it seems like you both found a way to do it. But even Joe, you mentioning how like you started that company with your friend and then you got so into it that you felt you were just only working and you felt empty. I feel like some people end up there without, you know, unintentionally, even though like a lot of people are like, okay, I have to make money first in order to have experiences and afford these experiences sort of thing. So what are, what is your advice for how people can have both at the same time, a career and a fulfilling life of all these experiences? That's a great question. And, you know, just, just to, for, again, for people listening, you know, we, once we had this realization that, you know, we felt that way about our experiences and the value, you know, we thought, how do other people feel? So we actually, you know, started doing, you know, first asking our friends and family, and then we actually started doing real actual research. And we went to retirement homes and asked elderly people, you know, what they valued the most in life. And then we actually ran a study of over 20,000 people around the world asking them what they valued the most in life, what they regretted the most in life, what they cared about. And the reason that that's so important to the answer to your question is so many things that people care the most about aren't big things. They're normal things. They're little things, the things that fit in your everyday, the things that fit in, in between the cracks. Um, and what we find and you know, again, to your point about people unintentionally winding up somewhere, it's not our fault. What we find is that we've all been conditioned basically to think that, you know, having a lot of money equals happiness for some way or another, when the reality is it's actually having experiences. So even if you have a job that maybe you don't love right now, there's a lot of things that you could still do in the time that you have that will make your life much richer. Um, so to give you some examples, like, the top things that people listed that they re regretted not doing or really wished to do were things like learn a musical instrument or learn how to cook or learn a foreign language. Like those are things you can do in like 15 minutes a day for free or for very little money. And it'll have a major impact on your actual happiness and well being. You don't have to go stay in overwater bungalows, you know, like that's cool. Yeah. But while yeah. you're planning for the overwater bungalow trip, maybe that's going to take you literally like those kind of bucket list things could take you two, three, five years to plan. Who knows? Along the way, there's lots and lots and lots of great quality things you can do with your time. You just have to be intentional. And I mm -hmm. think that analyzing how you spend your time, analyzing where you waste your time, which is your most valuable resource, is going to yield some really, really surprising results and going to offer some opportunities. I just want to add really quickly, if you're talking about, you know, work and how to have more experiences, I think one of the things that we don't really talk about enough is that is the way to build relationships is through new experiences and through doing, you know, shared things with other people. And, and if you're going to be at work all day and like you want to build those relationships with your coworkers and like try new things, like I think you should just go for it. And that's how to like, you know, build your career at the same time. It's like have great mm -hmm. relationships with your coworkers, right? And maybe you go, you know, do a cooking class together or maybe you 
even try like a new restaurant or something like that. But like, it, it doesn't have to be expensive or time consuming or anything, but, um, you know, maybe break out of that little routine that you have at work where you sit at your desk every day and eat your lunch and, and instead go do something new with, uh, you know, go for a walk or go for a hike with your coworker. Yeah. I love that. There's always some way to find a way to like use your time more intentionally, right? Even in the little things, right? Instead of having coffee alone, have coffee with a coworker or <laughs> yeah. little swaps, right? Yeah. No, I, I think that's a really good tip. Some people think like they're putting their life on hold. Uh, while they're working so that they can have the time to live their life in those like weekend moments or like, you know, the little breaks that they get. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. And we talk about that all the time. Like putting your life on hold is like, what are you putting it on hold for? Like, you know, people's excuses are always the same. It's always, Oh, I'll do, you know, this, uh, you know, when I graduate college, when I get married, when I Mm -hmm. have kids, when the kids are older, when I retire, and then like, where is the things that you really want to do that they're in like this, you know, fake someday thing. It's it's not real. Like someday's not a day on the calendar. Right. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't, we don't have, you know, one of the, one of the biggest problems is that we have deadlines for when our rent is due, for when we have to pay our taxes, for when we have to you know, finish a project at work or school. But our personal goals generally don't have deadlines, right? So that's mm-hmm. what gets pushed. That's what we say, I'll, I'll do that someday. And then we kind of just wait for it to somehow magically happen. So it's just so important to actually treat those things with the, the priority that, that should be treated because if you stop and ask yourself, and this is like, you know, I'll give you a kind of like some snippets of some of the exercises we do, but if you actually ask yourself, you know, what would I do if I only had a month left to live or a year left to live, you know, the things that you would do, those things are the most important things in your life because those are the things you'll regret not doing. But those are the things that aren't on your to-do list today or aren't on your calendar this year. So this is why like, we're, I think one of the ways we try to explain the message in the book is we try to give people the urgency of like a near-death experience without the near-death experience so they can start to, to really you know, see those things and get them on their calendars. Okay, let's take another break for our sponsor. The show is sponsored by BetterHelp. This time of year can bring some seasonal blues. Whether you're adjusting to the earlier nights or feeling anxious about the holiday season, consider how you'll be taking care of your mental health this season. Therapy can help you manage all the stress, anxiety, or emotions that come up during this time and give you the tools to find calm amidst the chaos. I've worked with a therapist on releasing anxiety and the need for control. It's helped me find acceptance and calm in uncertainty and be okay with however I'm feeling. If you're considering therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. And you can always switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash TLL. For the way you two live your life, like, do you, like, how do you plan your personal goals? Is it like the mo- the highest priority? Like what's your system, I guess, in making sure you actually go for these things? Sure. So for me personally, every year on January 1st, I sit down and I've been doing this for years. I sit down and I write exactly what I want out of a year. And like, does it always happen exactly how I want it? No. <laughs> but of course, things come up, whatever. But I will say probably have like a 75% uh, you know, success rate at this point. Like a lot of the things that I write down do actually come true because, so I have it hanging up on my mirror and I look at it every single day and I think about what can I do today to like take a step towards that. And, you know, a lot of the times it's, it's work goals. Like obviously this year, you know, we put out the book and that was the number one thing like I was like, if I just do that, that's enough yeah, <laughs> for yeah. the year. Mm-hmm. But I also like this year, I I really wanted to go to India and Egypt. And those are huge, you know, trips that, you know, take a lot of time and, you know, money or whatever. But, but I just think of things like, I'm not going to want to do that if I'm you know, when I get like elderly or, you know, if I'm, you know, retired at some point, like that's a hard trip. It's like a physically hard trip. And I was like, if I don't do that while I'm still young enough and like, 
I'm excited about it, then I might not ever do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, we planned it. It took a lot of work and time, but it was one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life and um, very fun and fulfilling. So, uh, I mean, for me, it's really is just writing things down, taking the small steps towards the goal, um, you know, having accountability, like having Joe and then, you know, other friends and family to tell people like, this is what I'm going to do this year. And I literally post my list every year on Instagram. And I'm like, if everyone sees this, they're going to ask me about it later. Right. They're going to be like, how's the book coming? How's the, um, you know, are you going to go to the pyramids or something like that? And that keeps me accountable to myself and to everyone else that I'm going to follow through on my goals. And it also creates this like ripple effect that, you know, people might see the things that I want to do and they'll be like, Oh, I want to write down what I want to do. And then I'm going to go for that. And then I can be their accountability partner. I think it's interesting too. The reason we use the wealth metaphor of experiential billionaire and how to build a life rich in experiences is because the similarities are very noticeable. For instance, you can't just wake up and go, I'm going to make money, right? That's not specific. You know, you have to have a plan. You have to be like, I'm going to, maybe I'm going to go to school and get a job in this industry, or I'm going to start this company. I'm going to do this thing. You have to have a specific plan, take steps. Well, our, our experiences are the same, right? So having that specificity allows us to like achieve goals or take steps toward them. And then just like our careers, those those goals and those those dreams and those plans can evolve, right? So like to Bridget's point, I do the same. We both do this thing called our treasure map every year. And it's like got all the things. I'm actually looking at mine. It's right behind my computer yeah. always. I stare at it daily. And uh, those things though, you know, maybe like Bridget said, when you you get good at it, you hit 70% or 80%, you feel great. But maybe the other 20% actually you look at later and you go, actually, I don't think I want to do those anymore. Something changed and something, you know, shifted. And, and, you know, maybe I'm going to do something, for instance, like she mentioned, like our, our book, we had to sacrifice a lot of other things because that was a heavy lift. And I'm sure people that are in an MBA program or maybe studying to take, you know, some kind of exam or, or, trying to get a promotion. There's times you have to sacrifice certain things for other things, um, which makes obviously a lot of sense. But those things can happen when you have intentionality and you have that vision for what that looks like. So I think that that's really important. But I also think that uh, one of the other things that that's really, again, I, we've been talking now about, you you said it yourself and I said it earlier about experiences versus, um, you know, money or making money. And I do really strongly believe um, that they're linked, you know, that our value, like when you go to a job interview, they want to know what experience you have. And, you know, we typically think that means job experience, but I honestly think it's a lot more than that. I think that, you know, you want to work with people that are interesting, that have mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a life experience that they, sh when they share it with you, you go, wow, that's cool. That's interesting. You know, whatever it is, you know, it could be like into collecting, you know, coins. I don't really know, but like if somebody does something interesting and different, you're like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Like we, we kind of joke about like the money thing isn't like really a good descriptor, you know, like if there's someone that you work with that, you know, has a Rolls Royce and a, a Rolex, that's not a really good description of them. But if there's somebody at your company that got arrested in Tijuana for something involving border <laughs> patrol and too much tequila, you're like, well, I kind of want to work with that guy. <laughs> they sound interesting. <laughs> or That girl sounds like a fun person to know. So yeah, you kind of, uh, you kind of get value out of that. And I think that actually takes you really far. I think that our experiential wealth translate to, translates to success in most areas of our lives. Yeah. I mean, even in like a, you know, dating, for example, it's like the person that is more interesting is going to get the more, more dates, right? No one wants to date someone who's like, my interests are literally doing nothing and uh, just staring at my computer all day. You know, <laughs> That's not, it's not going to get you very far. It doesn't have to be travel the world though, or like anything extreme sports. It can literally be, I love to cook and I learn a new dish every week. And I also, yeah, I play the violin or whatever those things are, but it doesn't have to be you know, adventure, thrill seeking, whatever. Totally. So tell us more about your study. I'm curious, like what were the biggest finds and also the, was there anything surprising that you found? The biggest finds? I mean, I think that the obvious takeaways are that, you know, nobody valued 
monetary things. Nobody valued uh, physical objects very much. It was all relationships. It was all experiences. And nobody, you know, I don't know. I think there's like so many cool takeaways as far as like learning, I think. Yeah, I I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say one of the things, the threads though, I thought were interesting was that, you know, there was a lot of themes like nature, a lot of things like, I wish I spent more time in nature. It's Mm. like, that's such an easy one for most people, right? Um, So just like the themes about like learning, I wish I learned X, you know. Yeah, one of my favorite questions was uh, that we don't talk about too much, but I love it. It's, it's like, what's one thing that you loved doing when you were a kid? And do you still do it? And why don't you do it anymore? And I love that because I think when we become adults, we often like shut off that part in our brain where we like just go play and go like have fun and like experience new things because we think it's not, you know, cool or it's not, you know, mature or it's not productive or whatever. And a lot of the people that answered like will say something like so silly, you know, something like, I love telling ghost stories or I love like, you know, fireflies or I loved uh, playing laser tag. And then they'll read the book and they'll go do those things and they'll like message us and be like, Oh, I just like someone told me that they just had a sleepover with their friends and they hadn't done that in like 30 years, you know, (laughs) like that's Mm -hmm. so cute. And I love that. And and those things are free or cheap or whatever, but like, are you going to remember that in in 10 years? Or are you going to remember like going out to the same bar you go to every day? Like, I'm pretty sure you're going to remember that sleepover with your friends because it's so fun. I think the biggest surprising thing too that's interesting is like, you know, how many people like referenced a negative experience as their most important experience in their life. Um, and that just again shows you that when you really want to think about what's where the danger in the way you live your life is, not non-action, inaction is where all the danger is. Mm. Action is where all the wealth is because even right. the stuff that you do that ends poorly has value. So it's really inaction that we're just like absolutely trying to avoid, right? Right. Like it's always worth it to take action and do the thing. Even if it goes wrong, then it is to like not try at all. Yeah. Then you know that that, you know, that thing actually, you tried it and, you know, it didn't work or whatever. Right. (laughs) And one of the things I love about like negative experiences like this is that a lot of the time, it's it's one or of two things. It's like either a really, you know, profound life lesson that you went through and that you're better for, or it's just a funny story later. And everybody <laughs> loves a funny story. <laughs> like, yeah. like no story is like, oh, everything went great and like my life is perfect. Like no one wants to hear that story. Everyone wants to hear the funny story. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Time for another quick break. Support for today's episode comes from One Skin. We all know fall brings with it a certain magic, but it also brings the challenge of dry, dull skin. One Skin has the must-have skincare that'll help your skin stay hydrated, healthy, and glowing all year round. One Skin products are powered by the revolutionary OS01 peptide. This proprietary peptide is scientifically proven to target aged cells and reverse the biological age of skin by several years in their groundbreaking research. I've been using both their face and eye products daily, and as I'm applying, I'm literally like, okay, OS01 peptide, go to work. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. They address skin health at the molecular level, targeting the root causes of aging so skin feels and appears younger. It's time to get started with your new face, eye, and body routine at a discounted rate today. Get 15% off with the code TLL at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with code TLL. We only have one body, one skin, and only you can choose to make it better. Age healthy with one skin. Another thing you talked about was your treasure map exercise. Can you share that with us? Sure. So the way that that works is, again, because of what we're trying to do to to bring up those things that people really want to experience or want to do in their lives. And people either A, don't take the time to think about those things ever, never really contemplate what those things are um, for the reasons we just talked about. Like maybe they're doing what they're doing in their life because of societal pressures, or maybe their family wanted them to pursue a career or a lifestyle or something. Or maybe they had dreams and goals that they just kind of suppressed and forgot about. And 
we want to bring those to the surface. We want to like bring those back. Um, and this is the way we do that minus the near-death experiences. We have people imagine that their doctor just called and bad news, they got the test results were back and, uh, and they've only got a year left to live. And then we ask people to write out what are the 10 things they would absolutely insist on doing in that last year that they know that they didn't do, they would have a major amount of regrets about. And after they write those things down, we give people some time to really contemplate that. Things that you could really do in a year. Um, after they write those things down, we ask people to then look at their list and say, how many of those things are you currently working on now? And it's almost always none, which is just crazy. You know, like, again, these are the, these things that are the most important things that you absolutely would do but you're not even, they're not even getting planned. <laughs> you know, this is how these things wind up going from yep. today ideas to like 20 years from now. You're like, oh my gosh, what happened to that thing? I just, yep. I thought I would do it later and I thought I'd always have more time. And then something happened and now I don't have time. And uh, yeah, that's really a big part of the, the, the exercise. We actually break it into multiple stages though. After that, we go down to like a 30 day kind of version of it. And then the right. doctor, by the way, this is a very, very terrible doctor. <laughs> so he calls <laughs> again and says, Hey guys, I did, I totally read this wrong. I had it upside said, down. I'm not sure. Oh, that's but, funny. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's actually one day you have left and what would you do then? And, and, you know, you can just start taking steps towards those things and start removing end of life regrets. Um, and this is right. something that I've done and Bridget have, has done very actively, especially over the last decade. And mm -hmm. uh, it's really cool because, again, as, it, as you evolve, you know, every year or two or three, you're looking back on, wow, I've checked a lot of things off that I no longer have to worry about the regrets for, you know, because I did those things. And it's, it's empowering. It's empowering to know that you can actually do that because i think a lot of people probably don't think they can do that until they try it yeah and, and that's kind of why it's like different than like a bucket list or something in, in my opinion it's because it's you know say you have one day left to live the it's not going to be going to the pyramids you know it's going to be like you know maybe it's forgiving someone that you've been wanting to forgive or maybe it's calling your mom or maybe it's like spending time you know on the beach or whatever it is for you you know, like those are the things that should be on your to do list today and not, you know, in some far away thing. Because you know, if you look at like the top regrets of the dying, like one of them is, is not keeping in touch with your friends, right? And that's a very easy, free thing to do. Um, so if you were on your deathbed and you were like, I'm going to reach out to people, like you waited too long, you know, like you can do that stuff today and like make sure that you don't have that regret later. Yeah. And that's really, I think, um, as far as like the tools we created, you know, one of the things that's really powerful for people that want to start to, you know, actually redesign their life is looking at that math, right? Looking at, okay, you know, I forgot, we, we use the Memento Mori chart, which is 76 squares, which is the average American lifespan right now, one year per square. And you have people fill, everyone fill out the how many squares they've lived. And then you can see how many you have left if you live to be the average lifespan, right? So once you look at it like that, and you see those boxes left in a chart, and then you start doing the math on things like, well, I see my parents once a year, is that enough? I'm only going to see them X amount of times. You know, my kids are you know, I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old. I've got X amount of years with them in the house. You know, how how many of those years am I going to take them on a summer camping trip or am I going to do X or Y? And as soon as you look at things like that, our time that in our heads when we don't think about is seems to be like endless, all of a sudden becomes finite. And then we, we get some like actual urgency to actually start doing those things. And especially when I think that matters too with the smaller things like if you tell yourself, if you look at some of these exercise results and you say, wow, I really do regret not being in nature more and I want to spend more time in nature, but I live in the city and I have a job in a cubicle all day, how can I fix that? You know, so you have to like start making those changes because you can't just get it all in like in one week a year, I'm going to go camping and I'm good. That's not going to solve the problem. Yeah. I mean, that exact situation happened to me. I was like, uh, I had lived in the city for so long and, and I liked it, but I was always like, man, I want to like learn how to surf. I want to like learn how to like, you know, I want to go paddle boarding and like, I want to be in nature. And, you know, after doing these exercises and going through a lot of like negative experiences in my life, like I ended up just like, 
I ended up just moving. And like, you know, of course my place is like smaller than probably what I can get in another part of the city. But, but this like makes me happier just to like be in nature. And like, now I don't have that like thought of like, what if I could do this? You know, you got to take away those thoughts. Like you can do it. Yeah. I, I did something similar when my dad actually moved to Mexico. I actually moved to the beach. I'd always wanted, I always said I was going to move to the beach when I was a kid. And then after that situation with my dad, I literally just thought, when, what am I waiting for? Like, why, why do I live by my high school that I grew up in? I have nothing really keeping me there. So I moved and it literally changed my life. It absolutely hundred percent changed my life in so many ways. And it wasn't like it cost more. I got roommates, got a cheap apartment, found a place, moved there and it changed everything in my life. And I think that, you know, people take those steps once that's the proof point of, wow, you know, that it can be done and they can do it. And really all of the stories that Bridget and I share in the book, you know, we, we like to say it in a way that's, you know, book isn't about us and our stories are just proof that anyone can do it. The book is about everyone else. It's about, you know, what are you doing with your life and hopefully how can we help make that better? Yeah. Obviously, I think everybody, I mean, those exercises that you shared would help people gauge like what do they want to do? How, how should they start? But I think a lot of what holds people back are they have a lot of fears and limiting beliefs as well, right? It's all internal. So what are your tips on how to overcome those things to actually take that first action? You're a hundred percent right. I mean, when, when we asked people what was holding them back from the, the things that they most wanted to do, it was uh, it was really one of two things. It was that they just never got around to it, never planned it, or it was they were afraid. Um, so there's a whole chapter in the book about fear, um, and that was it's one of my favorite chapters because it's something that everybody has in common. You know, everyone is afraid of something, and we're we're living in this society that you know breeds that. It's like everything is made to be scary. Well, because <laughs> really like we love our comfort scary. zones, right? And oh, everything yeah. good yeah. is outside of our comfort zone. Yeah. So how do you how do you push people and give them that nudge? Yeah. So for me, it's in for many people, it's it's really like exposure. And I go through a few stories in the book about how like one of the stories was uh I did all 50 states in the country and um I loved that experience because not only was it just awesome to go to all 50 states, but I also like met with people in every state and like got to know people and like where they're coming from. Maybe they have different beliefs than I do, you know, politically or, you know, they're different, you know, races, genders, whatever it might be. Like you just have to expose yourself to more and then you'll be like, oh, everyone is just a person. And like, we're all like 99% the same, right? Like we don't have to fear someone or something just because it's different. We have to like embrace it and be open to it. And then that makes it more, you know, easy to not fear. And if even if you take like, say you're, you know, afraid of sharks, <laughs> you go like, you're like, I don't want to go surfing but I really want to learn. So if you just go and you keep going, then you'll realize that it's just in your head. You know, like it's your brain telling you like this potentially could be dangerous or scary, but the reality is that it's really not. And it's just all in your head. So you just have to like do something. And then once you get that momentum and once you like see that it's not that bad, you can hopefully just keep going. Everyone has this tendency to absolutely over exaggerate in their minds what the worst possible outcome of something is that's what the fear is right it's like i'm going to do this thing and this i'm going to think of the absolute most horrifying outcome but we underestimate what the you know the best possible positive outcome could be so a big step for a lot of people is to stop and really think about that. Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? What's the best thing that could happen? And when you really break it down, almost everything that you're afraid of doing has far greater upside than downside. A lot of the time, most of the time, it's literally just socially being embarrassed of failing. You know, it's like people are afraid someone's going to see them fail at something or be a beginner at something. And we don't want to be beginners. We want to be cool and proficient, right? Once you get past that and realize this is your experience, you're denying yourself the experience of some thing, some activity, some whatever it is you're trying to do because of what other people might think, that's like you're punishing yourself. You're literally like, you know, hurting your, your, 
potential for a good time and a good life. And I think another way to get over those things is to really just like the other goal setting things is to break it into the smallest steps, the things you can achieve, you know? So for surfing, for instance, is an example that's extreme because not everybody lives by the beach, but surfing is really hard. So if you told yourself you're going to go surfing today, you know, a good goal would be, I'm going to get in the water with my surfboard and paddle around because you're probably not going to catch a wave by the way on your first day, you know, without an instructor and whatever else. Um, but that just shows commitment to like going and getting in the water and you know what's going to happen. You're going to have fun. You're going to have fun mm. not even being good because you set the bar <laughs> low and you got in yeah. the water and you did an activity that was new and memorable. But with anything that you're planning on doing, setting the bar low, creating those the, with the smallest step you can take to get that momentum going. And that's going to be helpful. And the other last part I'll add about that is the people that you surround yourself with are so important. So if you have a goal and you have a fear of doing it, find other people that have those goals or that'll support you in that goal, because that'll push you so far, so much further than you can do things alone. And you can't always mm -hmm. find actual people, but we live in a very wonderful time with you once you remove all the, the downsides of technology stealing all of your free time away um, it actually has so much potential benefit you know there's tons and tons we can learn from people whether it's on youtube or finding somebody like on an online kind of presence that can help become like an accountability partner to get you moving. yeah i think like one last thing on fear is that we always talk about being afraid of what's bad things are going to happen right but i think that one thing that we don't talk about enough is like the fear of success and what that looks like you know it's like say my goal is like to be a you know famous like movie star which it's not by the way <laughs> so, if it was what would that look like if it actually came true like my life would be completely different and that's scary and so people are often like afraid of what if it did happen and do i really want that so that's definitely something to think about when you lay out your goals. And I think the, the big exclamation point on it all, though, is that the study and all the stuff that we learned is that as people get older, they realize that what they should have feared was the regret because yeah. that's what you wind up with. Yeah. If we had that same amount of fear for the regret when we were young, we would do all this stuff. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's all flipped. Yeah. <laughs> you should just fear not doing anything. And that's the only thing to fear. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> say yes more and yeah. say no right. to the things that you don't actually want to do. Exactly. <laughs> okay, another big th I, I know a lot of people listening might be like, yeah, yeah, it all sounds great, but I literally have no time. That's probably pro one of the biggest excuses. Like my life is so busy, I'm overwhelmed. I have no time to do all this stuff. So what do you say to people who are in that camp? Sure. I, I, I think that uh, people will be surprised at how much time that they actually have um, because when you start to actually look at your time, it's really important. That's another exercise in the book is to track your time for a few days or even a week to see where you're spending time on things that aren't bringing value to your life. You know, because we all have to work, right? We, and we're not saying quit your job and like, you know, go hike across America. We're saying that look for all of the time that you're using for things that maybe are just comforts, maybe are just things that are just kind of passing the time because you're used to it. It's a hobby, et cetera, and replace those things and see what happens. Do it even just for a few days. And it's remarkable what people will come back and tell us, be like, oh my God, I, I, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with like watching Netflix, but what happens is if you scroll looking for something to watch on Netflix for hours every single day, that's not very productive, right? That's not very intentional. It's just kind of a waste. And if you replace some of those types of activities with, you know, oh, I went and learned how to play pickleball or I went and tried a new hike in my area that I didn't, ever, I never knew about or I, I formed a group of people. Like my wife randomly met in our neighborhood a group of ukulele players. My wife has a ukulele. And I was like, <laughs> they, they get together every Saturday. It's like, there's so many random things around us that can be new and interesting and fun. But if you start finding those little bits of time, those will turn into bigger bits of time because then you'll start to see, okay, I, I just needed to actually take control of my time a little better. Yeah. And we all obviously have different circumstances, and so it's hard. And, and I can tell you that I, Bridget and I both, again, this is part of why I think we're 
where um, we have some authority to talk about this is we both worked a lot. You know, I had two jobs most of my life um, and she worked a ton in corporate America. And uh, it's, you still can do this and find ways to, to get that value. Yeah. Usually like the time thing is, you know, people say I work all the time and I have kids. It's like, okay, like everybody works, right. Unless you're like independently wealthy, which good for you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And you know, a lot of people have kids, right. But the, the thing, I mean, and Joe can talk more about this because he has two small children, but um, you know, the thing is, is you got to have those experiences with the kids. You can't use them as an excuse. Yeah. The kids bring experiences and, and constantly I've, I'm always looking for things like the easy ways to explain or, you know, we try to make homemade pizza instead of buy pizza. It's something they remember, they enjoy. It's fun. It costs like $2. It's like super, super easy. You just have to you know, plan it. You know, we do like scavenger hunts in the park. They cost nothing. It's like a piece of paper and a pen and some 20 minutes of planning or, but doing those kinds of like little activities, are joyous they're memorable the kids love it you know we love it but there's tons and tons and tons of examples like that i think um but the and the money thing and this is again this this goes to the time for like the bucket list just like the bucket list question that people always seem to ask right are big big ticket things important in in money and time yeah they are right if you can if you have a dream to go to italy and you know drive across tuscany start planning it figure out what it's going to cost take the steps. It takes a long time. Do it. You know, it'll, if even it takes you two years, whatever, you, some people will figure that out and make it happen. But while you're waiting to do that, there's a lot of things that you can do where you're at now. So mm-hmm. don't let money or time be an excuse. Use the time and money you have now to do things now, because the time that you are spending, the overall time is non-refundable, right? That's the thing that's really non-refundable. Like if you look up and said, well, I was waiting till I had the money and eight years went by, it's like you didn't do anything that you wanted to do. You didn't like figure out how to squeeze in any of those little nuggets, but that's just really not taking the time to be intentional enough to figure out what you can do. I love that. It really opens up our mind to, there's so much that you could do in the, like the daily small things. Oh, to yeah. build the life that you want. Yeah, we've um, done all okay. kinds of weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Yeah, but, the weirdest. I love that. Uh, well, I, let, let's throw in like a little. Yeah, you know, we, we don't talk some. about. We don't talk mm-hmm. about. Yeah. Well, What's well, the weirdest thing you ever did, Joe? Oh, you know, that's actually. Yeah, I can't share that on you know, the, the federal <laughs> communication guidelines. But um, no, I was actually going to say that uh, it's not even just uh, about the things themselves, but it's about because we can't create more time, but the science behind some of this stuff is that the the time that we have, actually, you can expand it by doing new and novel things. Like mm-hmm. we all know that feeling of we just blink and all of a sudden Mariah Carey's playing in the office and it's Christmas. We're like, what the heck? You know, like it's already Christmas. <laughs> it's about to happen. Yeah, it's day. happening <laughs> right now. Like it happens, the year goes by because you're doing the same thing and your mind just kind of blurs that all together. But you, meanwhile, you take like a road trip for two weeks and it seems like it was like six months because every day is something new and unexpected. And that's a way to expand your time on this planet and in life and your memories and and all of those good things with it. So that's why even the small new and novel things, like you're going to remember the Tuesday that you went for a walk somewhere that you never went before. Even if it's in your neighborhood, you just took different streets or did something or whatever, that's going to be memorable because it's new. And it, that's why the new things are important. And that's why, again, we've done very weird things like, you know, we've tried a bunch of bizarre cuisines traveling that um, I don't recommend, like eating tarantulas and <laughs> guinea pigs and random things like that. Um, and, you know, we've we've gone off the beaten path in quite a lot of ways. Bridget's done some seaweed foraging and farm cool. school. And yeah, I've, I've found yeah, myself. I trained with samurais, yeah. I, <laughs> beekeeping. I think Joe, Joe's going fencing soon. Like we're, we do all kinds of weird stuff, but it's like, I remember that stuff so well, you know, maybe I did like beekeeping for one full day. Like that's just one day. Do you know how many days I have that I don't remember anything that I did? Yeah, <laughs> Cause yeah. All, Cause all I did was like sit on my computer or watch Netflix. Like I don't remember any of those days. So 
the point is to have like more days that don't blend into the next day, you know, like I'm going to remember those things forever. Yeah. And, and even with like your friends and your kids and the people around, you, you know, people always say, well, what about, you know, taking care of your family and to get yeah, of course, but you also have to lead by example, right? I want my kids, if I'm telling them you, you can live this, you know, rich and rewarding life. But then I just sit at my desk all day and say, I'm going to sit here because I want to make enough money to provide, you know, you know, what, you know, what do you think we need materially? My kids are going to copy me. They're not going to do what I say. They're not going to, they're going to say, well, that's what my dad did. I'm going to sit at a desk and work as much as I can. Your friends, your family, everyone, I feel like the more you as a person, the more all of us, you know, achieve our goals and, and, you know, fulfill our goals and our dreams, the more permission we give other people around us to do that. You know, the more people see, they go, oh, wow, I can do that too. I can try that too. And I think that that's really, you know, a powerful ripple effect that that we can have and and i think another thing that's really really interesting about it is when you try things you know you realize there's things you don't like or you didn't enjoy you know i i can think of lots of things you know i, I love mountain <laughs> like biking. i'm never doing that again <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's good to know <laughs> yeah then you won't do it again you tried yeah. it you're like okay that's it <laughs> my, my wife and i yeah. swam with with sharks and uh uh-huh. and and uh, yeah, she got right out of the water. <laughs> she was like, not doing that again. <laughs> she's like, that's cool. Yeah. I'm in the water, I'm out of the water. I did yeah, it. I'm done. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> but yeah, there's things like that. You know, I, I've actually gone on a long road bike trip. I love bikes and mountain biking. I don't love road bikes. My my butt's not equipped for that. I love motorcycle riding. I've discovered <laughs> I don't love crashing motorcycles. That's not very much fun. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that we learn along the way. Yeah, I had like on my list one year, like run a race. It was like a couple of years ago and uh, I did it. And then I was like, I'm good. I don't need to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to run like a double marathon or anything. Anytime. Yeah, but now you know, you have the experience and you, you'll you never wonder. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. You're now like, I'm like, yeah. I'm so proud of myself that I did that, but I don't need to. She's do like, yeah, next year, it. maybe a bake or something. <laughs> 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 like something like cookie based. Maybe I don't know. Sleep-a-thon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Okay. So now that the book, the book is out, do you have any goals for the future or what are you most excited about now? No, we're done. We're finished. That's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Last goal. Yeah. We've been speaking to uh, different corporations and conferences and uh, universities, and that's been something that's really enjoyable. And um, I love to tell the story and I love to hear what people are inspired by. And then when they follow up and say, you know, after your talk, I did this, like that really like fills my cup. And like, I love that. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, that's really the future. The future is, uh, is just trying to get the message in front of a lot of people. It seems to be really, really resonating um, oh, yeah. right now. And it's funny because mm-hmm. it's like, there's not like a very typical person it's resonating with. We're hearing it from like all you know, ages and walks of life, people are are coming back to us and telling us really interesting stories about the things they changed and did in their life because of this. Um, And uh, yeah, I think that that's just, that's why we're doing it. So that's, uh, I love that. Yeah. We're going to do whatever we can to get in front of people. Yeah. I think this message, like it it just applies to all humans and it's universal. We're here to live a full life. And we don't realize, I think it, it just reminds us to be more intentional with like every moment with, with all of our time. Cause time is what we cannot refund. Exactly. It's really uh, ironic because, you know, full disclaimer, Bridget and I talk about this, like we're not telling people anything new or anything they don't seem to know because the studies all bore out, like everybody seems to know this, but we don't act it. That's the crazy right. thing. We wait till mm-hmm. it's too late. And then we don't act it. So we're trying to like connect those dots and hopefully be that voice that they hear that makes them like realize before it's too late that what they already knew. (laughs) So, yeah, love that. Okay, finally, Bridget and Joe, where can we find you online? Sure, you can go to experientialbillionaire.com or our personal websites are bridgethilton.com and joehuff.com. Amazing. Okay. Any final message that you'd like to leave with the listener today? Get out there and do stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually want to ask you a question. What's one thing it. that you want to do that's on your list for someday that we can convince you to start now? Yeah. We'll be your accountability partners. 
one thing that I've wanted to do for a while, but haven't officially was actually like live in Asia for a few months. And it's because I have a dog. I have like, I guess I had things that held me he- at home and I never found the time to like go for that, like a long, long extended amount of time. But it is something that I do want to do. And I want to do it sooner than later, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier than it sounds. My, my, my wife and I actually um, worked and traveled for a year after our wedding and we spent a couple months in a bunch of different places, but I'd love to like chat with you um, afterwards. I can give you some, some of our, our uh, tools that we use to be able to do that effectively, but a couple months will turn into four months and it'll all fly by. Yeah, but it's kind of like you said, it's like sometimes you just get caught up in the busyness of your career, right? You have like deadlines and you're like, okay, well, I don't have time until this is over and then until this is over. And then, you know, just the time just keeps pushing back. Which yeah. one of the things though you think is going to have a bigger impact on your soul, on your on your happiness? Right. right? Obviously like those big dreams rather yeah. than the daily work life. Yeah. And you can yeah. work from everywhere now. That's right. the beauty of it. So. hmm Yeah. Well, thank you. (laughs) Awesome. We're going to follow up. We're going to be your accountability partners on this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. (laughs) 